All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the afternoon sessions in the in this room. To start off this afternoon, we have a series of three presentations on uh, various archaeological and uh, photographic um, activities that are going on on the lower post and the upper post. My name is Jeremy Nino. I'm the owner of Nino Cultural Consultants, and today I'll be briefly presenting around a little bit of work that we've been doing on the upper post of Fort Snelling. So with that, we'll get hopefully get started if I can make the screen advance. Let's see. All right. So um, the work that I've been doing is on the upper post, so not on the lower post. We'll do a little map here in a little bit to talks about it. But essentially, there is a company called Fort Snelling Leased Housing Associates. Um, they're a subsidiary of another um, national organization who is developing Fort Snelling's upper post uh, into essentially um, housing units for uh, different people, including military focused individuals. It's important to remember that, of course, it's all part of the historic district, National Register of Historic Place as Fort Snelling. So we're very familiar with lower post, but today we're going to take a little bit of time to talk about upper post. Ultimately, the project is going to um, take all 26 historic buildings. Right now, they're at 22 of the historic buildings, but they will be developing all 26 historic buildings and converting them into 192 units of affordable housing. So um, we're here at the, the confluence right here, and here's the buildings and locations that we're at right now um, in this one right here. Uh, but we're going to be talking about the upper post portion. So this is lower post, and over a period of time, they expanded from the area of lower post up into upper post and went all the way down through the airport down to about here. So this entire area was known as the upper post, and it expanded tremendously uh, during the uh, 1800s and 1900s. So we had a, a series of challenges as part of this project. Unlike uh, lower post, where there's been archaeology that's been completed for decades upon decades upon decades, with lots of historic research and other things that have been completed, um, upper post had been relatively uh, untested in a, in a lot of ways. There had been talk of an expansion of an airport runway into that area. So uh, Christina Harrison had done a little bit of archaeology in that area, but there hadn't been a lot of actual shovel testing or unit excavation that was done. So we started our work by shovel testing hundreds of shovel test locations to try and uh, see what was present. Um, of course, some I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, the toxic paints that were used historically to paint buildings at, in the upper post and lower post, of course, did a lot of lead contamination in the ground. And so when we were putting in units right next to buildings, we had to wear Oompa Loompa outfits to make ourselves uh, not be contaminated. Um, the, also, the, the upper post was massively overgrown at this time. Lots and lots of buckthorn, high grass. Uh, it was a wild, wild place uh, that hadn't been thought about in quite some time. Um, so our, our early efforts uh, were really intriguing. After we finished our, our phase one shovel testing work, we then continued on with phase two efforts, putting in multiple units throughout the entire landscape. We ultimately identified uh, four contributing features to the National Register. Um, and then we set about doing monitoring, which we'll be talking about for the rest of this. We started monitoring in April of 2021. It is now 2023 and we are still monitoring this site. Uh, it continues on, and we hope to be done uh, this year, but probably next year. It's going to take a while. All right, so one of the other things we got to do, though, as part of these efforts is, again, there hadn't been a huge thought process about going out and doing historic research on uh, the upper post like there had been when MHS went to out to um, the National Archives and did all this amazing early research on the lower post. They really hadn't done that part for the upper post. So um, we employed uh, Matt Fluger and uh, people from, from our team to actively really pull together everything that we could find from a documentary perspective ahead of our work and sort of let them pair together. And I just wanna highlight a few of the types of uh, materials that we use besides our, this is just our, our library at the office as a, as a background picture, but um, one of the most important records for the upper post is the use of quartermaster ledgers that document when buildings were put in, uh, what they're made out of, um, how they changed over time, how much it costs to do improvements when they were ultimately demolished, if they were, who did that demolition, 
Um, there's always a photograph that goes in place with those. These are, this is a great first step. There's a series of these quartermaster ledgers that were done over time, uh, and we had documentation from all those. So that's a, a nice early step. But of course, when you haven't got a chance to, you've got that little bit of ledger work that everybody has, there's so much more information that's out there. So Matt has several times, this is Matt in the, in the picture here, and he'll be doing a presentation a little bit later. Um, Matt went out to the National Archives. I went with him this last time to go and do a little, a little research work. Um, so the records are not housed in ways that you and I would be like, oh, when we think about how you archival and store things, um, you have these beautiful containers and long rows of, of stuff there. No, they've got them in these great boxes and they're all folded up like this and they have the original red tape on them and no one's looked at them for hundred plus years. Uh, this happens to be a, a ledger of all the books in the Fort Snelling Library that people don't even think about, but there's an entire ledger about that. So I was really keen on that, but Matt was in the background here um, doing some great work by pulling out all these maps, photographing them, including maps that showed things like privies. So this is uh, a series of blueprints for privies that were actually behind the infantry barracks in a different part of the fort, but that's a whole nother talk. Um, another piece of information that Matt was able to find is a document that shows the names and information about all the different officers that were in fact living on officer's row at the time that we found our archeology. span All right, so National Archives was a really important place to go, had a lot of fun there. And of course the historic maps that have been found throughout the years, including some in this last trip, uh, were really important for doing a lot of our work for monitoring. Uh, and I'm just gonna show you a couple of examples here of the types of maps. Uh, here again, we're on upper post. You can see that there's some infantry barracks that have already been constructed, two others that have not been constructed yet. Only these three still exist today. Here's Officer's Row and uh, the original officer's housing that was put in place. These ones up here still exist and have actually been infilled over time. And then way back behind here are stables and other things. They are not uh, privies in these shots. And the work where we were at was right in this area. This map actually shows some uh, sanitary sewer work that was done, which would come into play a little bit later. This is just a little bit later time period shot, same sort of thing, upper post, those outbuildings way out there. This is in the golf course now. Um, this road uh, still exists, Officers Lane still there. And here's the Officer Row houses. This one has shown the infilling that's gone on over time. And then sometimes we get maps that are color coded to help to determine uh, what buildings are made out of brick or wood. Um, this building right here, this little brown one, it's hard to see, is made out of wood. And that was a, a different part of our monitoring process that we looked at. Uh, I, could, I could talk to you guys for three days about all the amazing things we found on Upper Post. All right, finally, one last map. Maps are just great. So the construction monitoring process, um, there are there at any given time during the height of construction monitoring, which was all of 2021 and most of 2022, um, we've got uh, major ground disturbing events that are happening, six or seven different crews every day, five days a week, from the moment the sun comes up in the morning until the sun goes down. Uh, they work as seasonal employees doing their construction work. They do not care what time of day it is. When it is light enough to see, they begin with their work. When it is light, when it is too dark to see, they stop. And they do that every day, five days a week. Um, so hours were very long and uh, we were there every step of the way. Uh, the major types of construction monitoring we did was initially doing removals. So all the concrete and sidewalks and everything that was an ADA compliant all had to be removed off site first. So we did a lot of monitoring for that. Then of course they had to put in temporary utilities because while they're getting the utilities and rehabbing the insides of the buildings, you have to have utilities on the outside to actually provide light and heat and gas into the different spaces. And so they did a lot of temporary stuff. By the way, these temporary utilities, uh, the map work for all of the permanent utilities, of course we have great maps that show where they're gonna put those in. Temporary uh, utility maps are a guy drawing a line on a map and that's what you get. And so we, there isn't very good mapping for temporary activities. Other things are landscape changing. There is no single part of upper post that was not touched during this process. Every square inch of the fort has been touched in some way. A lot of it was done through landscape work where they were just like, we have to get rid of weeds. We could kill the weeds um, or we could just drive a bulldozer over them and get rid of the top two inches of soil. That also works. And that's what they did. Um, also, we have improvements to the outsides of the buildings. Of course, you need to have modern egress windows for all those apartments and the, the basements of units. 
Uh, you also have to repair the foundations of buildings. So a lot of work close up to the buildings, another thing we had to monitor. But finally, and most of all, the biggest single thing that we spend all of our time thinking about are the placement of new utilities. This is massive 20 to 25 to 30 foot wide trenches. They're going down 12 to 15 feet. In some places they're using not one mechanical box, but two boxes to do their work. Um, and you know, just, just for the scale of things, uh, this is an area in the ravine um, uh, next to the, the edge of, of uh, upper post. You know, this is the size of the excavation. This is the crew standing around. So it's really big work. This leads us to a day in May of last year where the uh, sanitary and water teams had just started going behind uh, the officer's row buildings. This is officer's row right here. This is the golf course on this side. Again, we had all those wonderful maps that showed us that all the outbuildings for Officers Row were way out here in the golf course. This had been a road for forever and a day. Um, everything looked great. We knew there was some sanitary previous work that had come along here. We didn't expect really to find anything in this area, but of course we monitor every single moment of ground disturbing. This is two sets of boxes. So that's how deep down they're, they're working. And of course my monitors are standing right there. Um, so, what we found is that there were, in fact, three privies back in this area, and they were built prior to water coming onto the site. The first houses are there in 1880. They had a shared privy that went directly behind each of those houses here, here, and here. And we found them by the teams uh, running into them during construction. So here's the first one that was found. I'll back up the slide. So we found the first one here. The utility teams came straight across through this space here and then turned up to go up the officer's lane. They encountered this privy first, this privy second. This one was not encountered during utility activities because it was outside of where utilities had to go. But ultimately we did find it later during a new utility line that was put in. Um, so the first privy uh, that we found um, behind uh, building 157 had, had previously been impacted by a utility, most likely a storm sewer that had come through because we had a lot of um, storm ceramic tile that had been dumped into the area. Um, they, they lifted up the box in this area. They started to come across it. We had them increase height and pull back and you could clearly see a nice rectangular black uh, organic rich soil area with limestone, laid limestone all around it. So that's the first one. So then uh, I'll back up and say, uh, we, we of course had protocols in place. We immediately, we immediately stopped construction. We, I get a phone call, I come out to site. Uh, then we get all the partners involved. They come out to site. We had a lot of great discussions uh, ongoing. It was decided that instead of just continuing with monitoring, we will go and look for more privies behind each of the buildings first. So we did small scrapes in all the areas and we found a second privy. Uh, behind two of the other buildings farther to the north. This one was uh, only a few inches below ground surface and completely intact in that area right there. And then um, farther to the south behind building 161, uh, a third privy that had been basically they were, uh, there is a, another utility that had already gone through the entire middle of this privy uh, several decades earlier when they were replacing that, they found that all that remained of that was a couple of points of, um, line, of limestone that were there. No archeological materials at all in this one. And this is John Strout, one of my uh, faithful monitors out there. So uh, excavation immediately went from phase one to phase two. Uh, we applied for licenses and started doing evaluation. Uh, you can see in this shot here that uh, in most typical privy fashion, the privy had been uh, excavated out several different times during its life uh, had been reused and other stuff thrown in. At the end of these privies lives, the last time that they were filled in, they were, or after the last time they were dug out rather, they were filled in with construction debris material from the building of the next set of officers rural housing. So that creates a nice uh, gap there. So this is just some of our excavation shots from our work. This is Fred Sutherland way down in there, uh, completing excavations. And uh, now I'll talk briefly about the artifacts. So we, from the from the two, the one partial privy, the, the other larger privy to the north, uh, we collect over 2000 objects. Primarily, although we have a lot of different materials, ceramics, leather, stemware, clothing, and ammunition, primarily the two things that were in these privies were bottles and ceramics, big pieces. 
So uh, that was a pretty interesting find. We were not finding a lot of faunal material. We're not finding a lot of food scraps, things like that. They're not dumping their um, everyday meals down this. They have other places to throw that stuff. But if you are looking for high-end ceramics, high-end glassware, and a few other interesting surprises, things that you don't want other people to know that you're consuming, this is a great place to get rid of things. Or when your tour of duty is done and the next guy is coming into your place, um, there's a little change out of stuff and they would throw those things materials away as well. Essentially, um, after doing complete excavation in the Northern Privy, we find uh, that we had a really nice tight 1880 to 1891, which corresponded with the first rows of officer houses uh, built and then a second set coming in. Uh, and by, by 1885, we actually have water and sanitary that are coming through these areas. So they weren't actively using these privies anymore. So we have that tight frame with 1883-84 as, as a mean for that. And then later on, 1900 to 1940, there's another period where essentially these uh, privies, once they were dismantled, they kept sinking down. So they had to keep throwing more stuff in there to, as it settled over time. Um, so here's some examples of some of the interesting things. Uh, this is the oldest artifact that's in there, 1862 chamber pot. One of the officers that came to the fort started uh, shortly after this. He brought his chamber pot from home. It went with him all over the United States for the um, uh, for, uh, 25 plus years of his military career. And at the end of his career, when he retired out of Fort Snelling, he threw his chamber pot away. So I really appreciate that. But 1862 is the start of that. Uh, but also we have other chamber pots from other times. This is a chamber pot, which actually commemorates the building of the Stone Arch Bridge in 1883, remnants of that. We have a special glassware that has QMD, Quartermaster's Department. You can actually, when you're drinking, you can see that. We have uh, really cool red transfer wares. The bottom of this one uh, says 081. So it's actually was made in October of 1881. Um, we have lots and lots of medicine bottles. We can trace exactly when these companies were in St. Paul and Minneapolis, and they all come between 1882 and 1886. So we know a nice overlap with those. Um, but then we have a few other items that were in the collection as well. Um, there's a whole series of medical instruments and syringes for injecting oneself with mercury uh, to get rid of things like gonorrhea and other diseases. Uh, we don't find these anywhere else in any other collections, to my knowledge, on Upper Post, and I've done a lot of the work up there. So we only find them in this privy setting. So uh, if you if you want to know the secrets of the officers and their families, look in the latrines. Clearly, that's a good place for it. Um, that is a very short tour of the work uh, at the privies. Uh, I appreciate your attention to this and enjoy the rest of the talks today. Thank you.